Ever since the introduction of statistics on websites such as HLTV.org in the latter years of 1.6, there's been a heavy emphasis placed upon them primarily by fans who go by the stats of a game to judge with a really kind of a hot take on who they think was good in the game or who was bad and who should be cut and who's the best player in the game and who's shit and who's good and who's bad and all these sorts of radical, drastic conclusions that people jump to even over a single map of Counter-Strike. Uh, but also, in the latter years, and particularly in 1.6, it feels as though there's been more and more emphasis placed upon stats by analysts, by writers, journalists, commentators. And part of the reason why, understandably so, is that not a, there's so much Counter-Strike now, you can't watch all the Counter-Strike. So people are trying to pick up on what they missed and get a vague sense of what's going on in the game. The problem is, when stats are used for that, when stats are kept in their place as a tool to supplement what you see with your eyes and what you analyze with your brain and what you reflect on and think about using the processes and models you've built up for how to understand Counter-Strike and the roles of players within their teams and differentiating how well they performed against each other outside of the metric of just what stats tells you, the numbers. When you use it as a tool and it's kept in your place, it can be an excellent thing. It can be something that adds to the game, that gives you more information, that does help out in scenarios where you watch the game and you want to get some more clues as to what might have happened or what maybe went on or something surprising that maybe the eye didn't tell you because you didn't see every POV within the game. This is where stats can be good. The problem is not many people are using it in that way and people are placing way too much emphasis on stats from single maps of Counter-Strike, from single series of Counter-Strike or simply who did the best in a game and then thinking that the number, the higher the number, the better performance. Now, the real issue here is that this video will take apart all the different elements of stats and how people think about them and show you that in every single instance, there are certain things you aren't thinking about when you look at the stat and take it as this draw, draw a big conclusion from it and think the stat tells you what's going on. And as a result, hopefully question your reliance on stats, your emphasis on how important they are, and more importantly, the notion that stats tell you what happened in the game. For me, it's the other way around. You watch the game... You read what teams are like, how they're structured, what people do within the team. You watch the game, you judge with your eyes, you judge with your brain, you think back on the game, you contrast game against the game against past games that have been played, against similar opponents, against lesser opponents, against spare opponents. And then you add in stats to say things like, okay, I have a sense that this is what's going on with the player here, and here's a conclusion I've drawn from watching a lot of games. Now, how do the stats match up with that? Like, are they pointing me in a certain direction where I maybe need to rethink something? Is there something that they back up and that makes sense in this particular sense? Stats are much better as addition to the theories that exist already. And remember, theory doesn't just mean an idea. A theory means you've taken a hypothesis, an idea, and you've tested it, in this case, against evidence or in experiment, like watching the game and watching multiple games and looking for patterns, and then stats can be added into that. But as the old saying goes with stats, like if you torture the numbers, they'll tell you anything. In this same sense, people who look at the numbers and then try to draw the conclusions from that and even change everything they saw in the game just to fit what happened in the numbers. So they watched a player, doesn't seem like he did that well. Somehow, suddenly the stats are well, oh, I guess he played the best in that game. They see a player win loads of clutches, but he doesn't have a great number at the end. Ah, oh, yeah, he, I guess he wasn't as good as I thought he was. Here's the thing. As a general rule of thumb, if you're talking about tons and tons of maps of Counter-Strike, yes, the guys who have the most frags, the guys who have the highest numbers, the guys who have the highest ADR, who have the highest differentials, in general, are the best players, are the better players, are the players performing better in general, ignoring all roles and all different levels of Counter-Strike. In general, that would be the case, just as the players who are performing terribly, very low kills, very high deaths, very bad differential, very low ADR, very high D DPR, very low KPR. Yeah, these players are the worst players. They are the worst players overall. They are the players who struggle. In general, that's about the most we can definitely conclude, is that you take the extremities, and yeah, stats are, are pretty decent for pointing you in the direction there. But even then, they only point in the direction. They just say, seems like that player's doing better. Now, when you try and judge how well that player is doing against another player who has good differential, good amount of kills, often just topping the scoreboard, now again, stats aren't going to help you that much. You can add in extra context, as you'll see when I pick apart some of the concepts of stats, which will you can add to the stat yourself. This is why the stat comes in to help you and your analysis. You can add in a certain other context that will help you then start to differentiate between players 
players who are good players and players who are bad players against each other. But without that, it can only really point vaguely in the direction, even at the extremities, even the most ridiculous cases, because there's so much nuance to how each stat actually relates to the game, because it is just a number at the end of the day, that you need a lot more finesse and a lot more thinking about how you think about the game, which in itself is learning to understand and appreciate Counter-Strike and model the game itself. That's why the number itself won't tell you. Basically, stats are quantitative. They count something. Number of kills, number of ADR, lack of kills, lack of kills relative to deaths. Now, what we're looking for when we're making opinions, when we're coming to conclusions, when we're bringing, con making hypotheses and then testing them and coming up with theories and a body of philosophy and a model of how the game's gonna work and judging people, is we're not being quantitative at that point in time. We're not just saying, okay, he had 24 kills, the other guy had 20 kills, the guy with 24 kills played better and is a better player. No, that's not a very nuanced way to look at the game and you will often come to quite ridiculous conclusions if you if you follow that approach, which is a lot of the pop you're doing. Rather than quantitative, we're trying to be qualitative. We're trying to actually take the numbers, but then judge what is the context of these numbers? How do these numbers fit against each other so that even if a number's higher, was that player actually better than the other one in terms of, I mean, what is better? What is more important in a round? What wins you around? Is a kill just what wins you around? Are kills all the same? It's, uh, we need context, which comes from ex expertise, and in nearly all cases comes from having watched the game. It's very difficult to make really reasonable conclusions with any kind of definitive nature to them without having watched the game, no matter how many stats you've looked at and how many you've compared, etc. And yet, that's how so many people are using them, even the people who are incredibly into stats. So they, they know some of the things I'm telling you, and they'll still write an article where they'll take the stat and let the stat tell them the storyline of the match and what happened in it and these sorts of things. Now, I understand if they didn't watch the game, that might be a lazy, quick way to write the narrative, but some of these people are experts, and it's like they're letting the numbers be their master rather than them being the master of the number. So essentially, there's a good tagline for you, okay? It's like the line about alcohol, okay? Stats make for great servants, terrible masters. So when we talk about stats, there aren't many advanced stats on sites like hltv.org. We don't have access to a lot of them. So in general, the main stats at the moment that most people use, and as a result, it's not worth talking about the advanced stats anyway, and as much as even a lot of the experts are still using these basic stats, the main ones we're using are kills, differential, so as in take the kills and minus the deaths. So the differential can be positive or negative. ADR, average damage per round, the amount of damage you did over each round averaged. Kills per round, averaged. Death per round, deaths per round. Then beyond that, you've got all those stats, but you can then factor them on different scales. So the simplest scale is one game, one map. Then you've got a series, so two or three maps, assuming it's a best of three. Then you've got an entire event, so every map you played in that event. As we consider more of the original stats and judge them against each other, we are gonna be able to arrive at somewhat more definitive conclusions, but still they will just suggest something which can only be confirmed or really judged qualitatively by actually watching the game and then considering the context of certain scenarios, including the kills, damage, etc and the opponents and what happened in the game. Now, with that said, the further up the scale we go of more games, higher sample size, larger sample size, in this scenario, yeah, we're getting a little bit more and more solid, a little bit more cemented in what these things tell us. But even with the scale, it has its own aspects of context and special nuance that needs to be applied to the scale that you don't see in the individual game because you break it down differently in the game. Because for example, in the game, you know who the opponent is. Now you still got to consider that and scale it. But in a whole tournament, you might not be sure who they played early on, if they played a bad team, if they had a hard route. So there's different types of context even has to be applied to the scale. So sure, a series tells you more than a game with the stats. And an entire event tells you more than the series and just the games. But again, they have their own special considerations to be made. So people using just pure stats, just the numbers, and just comparing numbers directly and using the logic of this number is bigger than that one, or this number is a better average than this one, therefore it's better overall, and that player therefore is better, and therefore he is performing better, and therefore he should stay in a team and the other person should be cut. These sorts of ridiculous conclusions are inherently ridiculous. And so let's start to pick apart the problems with stats. So first and foremost, the first type of stat, the main one actually people used to use back in the day before they learned about differential and ADR is kills. Obviously, Counter-Strike, the key 
bedrock of the game is kills. Like you can be the best player in the world. You can be on the on a team full of geniuses. But if someone in the team can't get kills and crucially enough kills, then you're not going to win rounds. You're not going to have a chance to win tournaments. And you're going to go deep in tournaments. Hence why this term firepower, you know, how much firepower a team has. And by the way, you can have too much firepower as FaZe has shown us. And you can have too little firepower as a team like Flipside shows us. But this is why the concept of firepower is important. But even so, by the fact that you can have too much firepower, it's not just about even kills. It's not just about how much ability you have to get them. So when people talk about the idea, a very simple idea, and admittedly, this is the lowest level. Most people don't think this way. A lot of people are advanced enough not to think on this simpler level. But let's imagine the logic that the most kills in the game performed the best in the game. And we're just going to imagine a map right now. One map, the most kills in the map. He must have carried the map. He must have performed the best. First and foremost, that ignores the context of the kills. Like, not all kills in Counter-Strike are equal. And not of all equal value, of equal impact on the round. Not all equal in terms of the skill it takes to get them. And yet, stats, in that sense, just putting the number 24 above the number 20, makes it so that all keys, kills are counted equal. There's a problem right there. Were the kills impact kills? There's games where you could have 15 kills in the whole game, and you could have dominated this by winning, like, five 1v1s or a whole bunch of amazing kills when you were on a four spy which broke the round and got you into... These are incredibly impactful kills. Meanwhile, someone else could have 20 kills and he could have eight of them against eco and opponents and he could have a couple on a round where he was in a 1v3 and he killed two people and he saved the weapon and he had to run away because the bomb was going to explode. All these sorts of scenarios. There's an example of where, even though the number's actually quite higher than the other one relative to one map, Actually, I've made one game almost worthless of no impact or value, and the other game incredibly impactful and of value, despite the fact that one seems quite mediocre pedestrian, one seems pretty good, and in the end we find out that the numbers aren't equal, and that the numbers can't be treated equally, and that certainly the other guy did not carry the game, and this guy did not underperform. So again, here's another scenario we have to ask. Who was the kill against? Not all enemies in the game are equal. Not all of them have the same health, have the same value in a round, are just as good as each other, etc. I mean, there's certain star players, a good example might be AWPers on a certain map, who go head-to-head -head with another star player. Their job, if they're getting just slightly more kills and deaths, might be immense. They might be cracking the whole round up, taking away an enemy that kills their teammates. I mean, famously, some of the best AWPers in the world, Guardian, Kenny S, when they were at their primes, they didn't always even kill each other necessarily. If they just go to separate parts of the map, they kill the, the other guy's entire team. And it's almost like that's how the battle goes. Well, if they go head to head in this scenario, it's incredibly important and impactful if one of them kills the other one. He Now that team has an ult, the other one doesn't necessarily ult, has to go to a weaker player. This is a, an example of how kills are not equal. That's an incredibly impactful kill. How many kills were eco frags? Now, here's one of the things. We've always, that's always been something that even people who are quite new to the game and the concept of stats understand the concept that if you could, we'd rather ignore eco frags, right? Problem is, in CSGO, which has less of a strict hierarchy and less economic management, as in fiscal economic management, compared to 1.6, where you had more hard saves and less people buying deagles all the time or PT50s, etc., which, I mean, those guys didn't exist in the same way in 1.6. Problem in CSGO is, it's a lot harder to manage what even is an eco, because now we have so many variants of low econ buys. Now we have people who save, but because one person has slightly more money in the round, he buys a Scout, and then the rest buy a P250, and then one of them buys a CZ, and that's considered a save. And yet that kind of an eco, not a full force buy, not spending up all the money, still saving for the next round, that kind of eco is incredibly more dangerous than the guys with just USPs, or guys on the T side with just Glocks. And so kills against just the Glocks, just the USPs, much less impactful, much less difficult, much less valuable than kills against the guys who have some weapons that actually, if they got in the right situation, could do a lot of damage, could kill someone, take a gun, and have incredibly big impact. So even in that scenario, actually to kill that guy, sure, in a sense, here's the problem. It's not as good as killing a guy with a rifle to some degree. It probably isn't as important in the game, but it's more important than killing just an eco guy who's essentially just a helpless guy because you still need to get these kills to secure that round for yourself. So how do we grade these kills in, in terms of qualitative value? We don't. We just put the numbers on the screen and even experts working for these stat sites write articles and don't grade this at all and aren't able to take this into consideration and don't give us that stat of what is and isn't an eco frag. And unfortunately, like I'm saying here, in CSGO, it's quite hard. I mean, one idea I had was to have a stat where essentially the concept is like power weapons. And so the concept for me, in general, the stat I'd like to see, just because even though it excludes some guns that could be counted in that category, this would make it very streamlined. I'd have a stat where it's called like 
significant, primary significant kills. And that's kills from someone holding an AK, one of the M4s, or an AWP, against someone holding an AK, an M4, or an AWP, with armor, both sides. They, have, they both have armor, they both have to have one of those weapons. I'd love to see an isolated stat of that from a game. Like, this is how many primary significance kills he got. Then I'd have one where it's someone with one of the power weapons like that against someone with one of the power weapons, and the person being killed doesn't have armor. So he's done some sort of weird force, but that would be a secondary significance kill. You see, it's already... I'm already having to build in the context that I would see with my own eyes if I watched the game and my model of how to think about the game into the stat that the stat can't tell me by itself. Sure, the data's hidden in there somehow, but we don't have a filter to get it out to me without me watching the game or without me making notes, etc. And in that scenario, the stat isn't helping much. It's pointing roughly in the direction and then I'm taking something away from it and I'm judging it myself. So again, the person, the observer, the judge is inherently involved in this process. It's not that the stat tells you what happened in the game. Okay. Let's think more about how kills aren't all equal. What if the enemy was chasing someone down? Let's imagine Happy from Envious, don't know why I picked him, is in a 1v4 on the CT side and the enemies have taken over the other bomb site. He's hiding either towards spawn or in the other bomb site. And as the enemies hunt him down to try and get his gun from him, all his teammates are dead. He picks off two guys and then successfully hides and doesn't get caught by any of the other two guys. One of them is protecting the bomb, the other one decides not to go for him when it's a 1v2 at that point in time. He's in 1v4, he kills two people, they get away. Now, sure, he has done economic damage to the enemies, but let's say the enemies, because they plant the bomb, the bomb's exploded, let's say they've won a bunch of rounds, their economy's totally healthy. Realistically, he's probably not done a lot there. There's probably very little value to those kills, even for his individual score. That doesn't mean he played any better, particularly. Sure, he didn't lose his gun also, which helps his team a little bit in terms of economy, gives him a little bit of opportunity. There's some value to it, but it's not the same value as someone straight up in a 4v4, killing like a key person holding a bomb site to open it, both with power weapons, both with armor, then getting in a position to allow the bomb to go out. See, you can see the value is different there, and yet they're counted as the same on the scoreboard. And also, that sort of padding lets your number go up. You didn't have a lot of impact on the game. Then you've got to consider, what if you're in a game where you're winning the game, but the enemies, when you're on CT side, always go to the other site, and either your team just wins the site there, you're just seeing names come up, obituaries in the top right-hand corner of the screen if you're the player, or they take over the site so dominantly that there's only like two of you and two V4s and two V5s and you don't have opportunities so you just have to save and you just have to hide off and you might be able to pad the odd kill but in general you might win the game and your team wins the game but you get very little opportunity for stats and yet it looks like because your numbers are low you didn't play that well and then when that's added into your performance for the tournament it brings that down a little bit and then when that's added into your event it wasn't super sick on some of the maps and so these sorts of things aren't really considered. We just hope that it happens equally to everyone and therefore it's something we don't have to think about and people don't think about it. Think about the idea that all kills are not equal. So here's a, here's a great example of it. I'm gonna put in as much qualitative context as possible to show you how being unable to tell this from the number is massively vital. So think about this. You have an AK-47. You have 100 health and you are shooting long range on dust two, you're at the top of A, the other guy's in pit, let's say, and the enemy has a Glock and he has one health. And you shoot him and sure, you won't get much ADR off that. You can only get one damage, right? But he has incredibly low chance of killing you. You have a very high chance of killing him. When you kill him, it's not particularly skillful, probably doesn't add much to the round. It's something of an eco kill. Meanwhile, that kill goes on the scoreboard. You've got one kill. Now let's imagine that you have a P250, no armor and 50 health. And you're against Guardian, who's long range. And you run around the corner and you aim and you headshot him with two bullets long range. And you really aim well. And the other one like goes in, dodge, misses a little bit. And he misses two AWP shots only. That can happen. And you kill him and he's, his AWP's gone. These are counted as equal kills. They're considered equal to each other. There's no, there's no judgment made. There's no way that the number can tell you what the difference between those two kills are or what happened there. Only watching the game can tell you that itself. So, okay, nice to have the number, but then nice to know when to discount it and when to count it more, right? That's when we need to know. As a final comment on kills, we to this day 
don't track pistol round kills. Now, the good thing about that, by the way, is I'm not saying pistol kills for the whole map. That would be problematic because of ecos and force buys and half buys and saves and AWPers saving with the pistol when they could have bought a, an SMG. But the idea we don't even track how many kills you get on the pistol round, I mean, th those often are quite important kills and we don't even track that. Not least because on a pistol round, you very rarely save. You're nearly always going for it. Now let's talk about differential. So that's the plus minus on that scoreboard that we're always seeing, which again, I think, okay, kills in itself, not that good. Unless, for example, the guy's a playmaker and he gets a lot of kills. Okay, then regardless of everything else, he's probably to some degree doing his job. Entry fragger, whatever it might be. If a guy has a good differential, then I think in general, because it's taking into account more things, it's taking into account a couple of stats at once. In general, differential is a bit more telling than just kills. So let's talk about differential, because most people use differential to decide the best performer. They say, right, he was plus 20 in that game. He absolutely carried super sick performance. Okay, here's the problem. Yes, again, a really extreme differential or a really bad differential very likely do point to the fact that that guy had a good game, this guy had a bad game. They don't necessarily have the best game or an amazing game or the worst game or a terror or he was the worst player. They don't say that, but they point in that direction. And if you investigate, you'd often find that would be the case. The problem is differential as a stat is incredibly role dependent. So Olaf Meister in Fnatic in 2015, in the middle of the year, was one of the best, if not the best playmakers in the world when he was on Terra's side. And on CT's side, he would make contact, he would initiate moves, risky moves, he would attempt to always take aim duels with the enemy, he wouldn't play off in a site passively. And so he's someone where he's creating action, which draws focus, that's before a single bullet's been fired, that's before anyone's been killed and any stats been registered, which relieves pressure on the map for other parts of his teammates to move through there or to rotate or to make uh, information calls. He's giving information calls. Again, doesn't show up on the stats whatsoever. And in this scenario, let's say he kills one person and he dies. In that scenario, the scoreboard says no differential for that round. He's a zero. But... He actually did something impactful, something valuable, and he might even have then set up another player to get kills, who gets two kills, let's say Flusher's playing passively on the site, he gets two kills, now it looks like Flusher had the better performance in that round, but not necessarily. That's not, a, that's not as simple as making that judgment. I mean, maybe Flusher gets the information, and the enemies are looking at Olaf Meister, that Flusher shoots one in the back, and then he's just in a standard 1v1 with one, who has lower health maybe, because Olaf Meister shot him, and he kills that guy. In this scenario, you pick it apart, and suddenly the differential doesn't really tell you a whole lot for that particular around, right? So someone like Olaf Meister, or a playmaker in general, someone who's an aggressive player maker, is going to die quite a lot. Like his differential to be really, really high, if Olaf Meister in that scenario in 2015 had a really high differential, then he had a godlike game, if you understand this, this concept. Because he's putting himself in positions of risk and danger and initiate an initiative to create plays where he is going to die a lot. The risk is high. Now, he's doing it because when he pulls it off, because he's so good, the reward is high as well. So he's going to get a lot of kills because he's a very skilled player, but he's also going to get a lot of deaths. So he's going to have good kills in the first category, but when we come to the differential, he's not going to have that great a differential. Meanwhile, a guy like Cold Zero, also one of the best players of all time, one of the best players in the world right now, in general, he's often going to play more passively. He's often going to be cleaning up people that have lower health, that have been spotted, that communication has been relayed to him. He's going to have an idea where they are, so his differential for the same level of skill and the same level of performance can be massively bit wider, can be much, much bigger. And on paper, you'd say, wow, he had a way better game than Orthmeister there, but not necessarily. It's not necessarily the case at all. Also, he benefits from people playmaking for him in that scenario. So another situation. Oftentimes, a super sick orping performance will result in a massive differential. Go look at the best games not even the best games. Go look at a good game for Kenny S or Guardian. They will nearly always have a great differential because what happens is since you kill the opponents with one bullet and therefore, and at long range, they've got way less opportunity to put bullets into you and you're dying less because you're just killing them instantly. And therefore, your differential is getting pumped up like a motherfucker in a way that pure riflers against other great riflers aren't going to be able to get the same kind of mad differential. Now, sure, the Ops are a very difficult weapon to use. It's very expensive. You have to be in position. People can flash a smoke out. Therefore, you're not going to have all these differentials all day long, but you're going to have games that are going to be really skewed that actually, when you watch the game, he didn't really dominate as much as it would have suggested. Like a Shox plus 20 performance might be much, much better than a Kenny S plus 20 performance on a given map, depending on the opponent and the situation, obviously. You've got to consider that sometimes a player who has kills, even with a lot of deaths and a low differential, might have had a good game, 
because maybe he's the star player on the losing team who are getting wrecked. So he's getting kills. He's still not dying that much. And he ends with like a small minus, like a minus five. But his team only won seven rounds. The opponent won 16, obviously. He was always out of position. The enemy went to the other side often. He, let's imagine someone like Nico. So he did as well as he could in terms of fragging. He tried to make plays. He's died a lot as well. And his differential tells you he wasn't even as good as the fourth best player on the winning team because they've dominated. But if you look at the actual game and analyze it, he was much more impactful. He actually did more than the fourth best player on the other team, perhaps, in terms of stats. Likewise, the star on the winning team isn't necessarily better in that scenario because he had a bigger differential. He might have had his whole team in this scenario propping him up. Maybe the whole team did fantastically and everyone ran riot and he benefited from other people opening this up and he was following them up and killing people with like two health left or knowing a guy shooting him in the back. Maybe he wasn't even as good in the actual game as the guy who's the star player of the losing team. We know it's happened before. I mean, Nico again, perfect example of that, right? One of the problems is you often can get really skewed outlier differential games where a team is on CT side, I mean, famously a team like TSM, the now Astralis team have done this many times because it was such a good CT side team. You'll have a game where because the, the CTs run up a massive score on CT side, like 12, 11, 13 rounds on CT side, and the whole team dominates and shuts down all attacks and they're not getting very much economy and they're not having many chances to kill you and you're all just killing them quite easily and they're going slower, so it's easy to pick them off and rotate over. The superstar of this winning team on CT side might go like 23 to five. Now the differential tells you, holy shit, he dominated this map. He's a fucking god. But you know what? You actually watched the game and yeah, he was the best player on his team perhaps or he got a lot of kills, but it wasn't really an all world performance actually. It wasn't as amazing as the stat line tells you. Then you've got to add in that your role can also mean you get less frags than most of your teammates, but by helping someone else, you actually have more value than someone who has some more kills than you, but wasn't a superstar. So, I mean, obvious examples of this in the past. Freiburg in NIP in early CSGO. Because his job was, I mean, if he could even go one-to-one, -one, that would have been a success. But in the early days, sometimes he'd go two-to-one entering a site, and then Forrest comes behind him, cleans up everyone, or does massive damage, and then Get Right wins the clutch as well. So Get Right and Forrest are just are completely benefiting from something that Freiburg's doing. They're becoming the superstars, then they are. But Freiburg's doing a very valuable role, despite the fact, in general, he's going to be more towards the bottom of the scoreboard in both games. Another example, famously, whenever they played Inferno, late 2014 LDLC, early 2015 Envious, was a very good Inferno team, one of the best in the world. And part of the reason they were amazing is they, much like Fnatic, had an amazing B setup. But unlike in Fnatic, where the B setup was, Olaf Meister was the guy who worked with Crims and didn't really have as big an impact and many kills, but Crims would get all the kills and play the site perfectly within anchoring inside that B site. In Envious, it was the other way around. NBK would play the anchor role in the site, but his job was to peek out and to be bait and to draw people into him where he'd do a pretty good job. And then Happy would do amazing bait work, but quality bait work properly, how you're supposed to do it. And he would kill people in the back and he would go through smokes and he would go off flashes from NBK and he would clean up all the kills and they were an amazing duo. So in one of these scenarios, Olaf Meister is playing the role to help Crims. And in the other one, NBK is playing it what looks like the same role as Crims, but he's actually playing it to benefit the scoreboard of Happy in this scenario. And yet NBK's score is not going to be that good. Yet Happy will look like he dominated the game, but he couldn't have done it without NBK in that scenario. Which doesn't mean NBK was better than Happy, but it means you see that the roles mean that the number doesn't tell you who did what and who was better in that sense. Simply, this is a real big problem. One of the problems with differential is sometimes you can be having a good game and just because you don't die, it will skew your differential massively. So let's say Happy's having like a decent game. He's got like a, some impact kills. He's getting some kills and padding when people chase him and he just can't go for the bomb. Anyway, let's give him the credit. He can't go for the bomb in some of these scenarios or it's too many opponents. And he does a good job. He gets kills, doesn't lose his gun. Okay, but because he now gets quite a few kills and then dies almost not at all, now he's got a really good differential in a game where he never gave them a chance to win. He never did anything above and beyond anything. He had an average game, but his stats tell you he had a really good game. And that's something, unfortunately, in that particular player's career, Happy, he has shine, kind of shown a punishment for, a specialty for, and he's had some, I would say, illusory or mildly fraudulent games. When you consider that his peak, he was a fantastic player because he did relieve map pressure, etc. Now let's go into another stat, a stat that I, I'm going down like the hierarchy here. So kills, okay, kills can be good. They can indicate something, but it's role dependent, enemy, what type of kill. Then you go to differential. Again, depends what your role is within that. Depends what type of map it was. Depends where the opponents went in the map. Then you go, an even better stat. One of my favorites, ADR. Now I think ADR is a pretty decent stat. Okay, as a stat, I think it's one of the most reliable for a single game. 
but it has issues itself. Like for example, if your team is getting ultra stomped, you are going to be incredibly limited in terms of your economy. And you're gonna be incredibly limited in terms of your opportunity. You're trying to kill this guy and three people over here shoot you. You're trying to take a 1v1 against this guy, but you've already been pushed back and you're health damaged killing another guy. These are problems since so your ADR is going to be quite low and yet you might again have played better than people on the winning team who are ultra stomping. Likewise, you could win tons of clutches against people with low health and be the biggest impact player in the game or for your team, but because they have low health and because you're on the losing team, you don't max out your ADR. And you were the star of the game, but unless someone watched the game and knew you won the clutches, they won't necessarily know that you're the best player from your ADR. Now, I actually also think that if you look at the concept of the clutch stat, this is a digression. Sometimes we have the clutch stat. It's not put on the main section of the scoreboard in like news posts and stuff, but you can find clutches out there on individual players' pages, etc. Now, the problem I have with the clutch stat is, here's a great example of a stat that I don't think tells you that much. In general, if you find a famous clutch player who you've seen win a lot of clutches and you see that his clutch stats are good, that seems to have some correlation. My problem is, people actually ran the numbers on stats on clutches last year. A guy looked it up and he looked up 1v1 clutch stats for all of 2015. And the rule was you had to have a minimum of 10 lands played. And I'll put it in the description box below, the image file that is this list, okay? And you will be shocked because it's ordered by percentage one. Now, obviously someone who went 14 and seven, like I think like Dennis or something or Spiddy or something, that's not as good as someone who goes like 36 and, well, let's let's make it not even that great, 36 and 25 or something. Well, I mean, that's that's actually not that, no, no. I made the differential too much there, haven't I? 36 and let's say 29 or something. So in this scenario, because he had way more opportunities and won way more of them, that one's way better. But the point here is, okay, when you look at some of these, you're going to find some shocking ones. Like, for example, Freiburg had a terrible 2015, and yet he had stat 1v1 stats of 31 and only 13 lost. So quite a high volume, 31, only 13 lost. And he was above in clutch stats, get right, seized, flusher, device, flamey snacks. I'm listing players here who are some of the best in the world, or some of them very famous for clutches. And, and the stats tell us, the number tells us, Freiburg's a better clutcher than those guys. Now, after having watched the majority, in fact, pretty much all the really important land games, that can't be the case. There's something about the way that stats are being interpreted, or the concept of just calling any 1v1 clutch against each other, that doesn't really work. Now, someone should probably investigate that. They should say, well, that doesn't add up in that sense. But unless you watch the games and you just go by the number, you're not going to be even, even question that, are you? Likewise, in 2015, a player who fell off massively was Smiths, right? We all know that. Smiths won 27 clutches, lost 16, 1v1 clutches. Again, doesn't add up. There's fantastic players, had much worse stats than this. So we've gone down all, now we're getting to the concept of moving up the scale. So we've gone from games, we know that a series to so two or three maps gives you more chance to really see how someone did. One of the stats I like, along with ADR, is I like event history. So this is how many maps you played in a whole tournament and your stats for the entire tournament. Now, because it's more sample size, yeah, it's gonna give you a little bit better of a suggestion of how well the player did. In general, this is not a bad guide, depending on the fact that obviously you have to rate events against each other. It's much better than any of the other stats. So for example, when you look at event history, one of the things I like to look at is, you look at, if you're looking for how good, how well star players did, first number you want to look at, KDR, number of kills, uh, KPR rather, number of kills per round. If, they, if they're getting quite a lot, they fragged pretty well for that event. That's the most basic thing it tells you. But for really star players and people in key roles and playmakers, you want to know that. You want to know how well they did in that particular sense. Then you're going to look DB, DPR, deaths per round. If they have a very low deaths per round and a very high KPR, they had a fantastic tournament. They gave a, a great differential just in terms of like killing a lot, not dying much. They probably had a, a reasonably big impact on the game. And in terms of low deaths per round, unless they are an extreme playmaker... In this scenario, they probably also had a very good tournament just in terms of how they played to not die much as one of the star players. Someone who made it deep into a tournament played a lot of maps, let's say eight or nine maps. A good differential over a whole tournament usually is pretty good. Usually, the better way to think of differential is not just to look at differential for one event. You want to look at differential for a few events. Get like three or four events of similar, comp like similar level, similar level of opponents, similar level of team that the guy was playing on. Now look at the 
plus minus the differential over those and try and take an average or look at what his ups and downs are. And now you're starting to get a get better picture roughly of maybe how good this guy is, how much impact he has, how many kills he gets, these sorts of things. Even so, even on event history, you have to start picking it apart. So for event history, you have to ask, someone has really good stats. Yeah, but how many of those came against the weakest team? Like let's say in the group stage, he plays a terrible team and he went sort of plus 20 and he had amazing kills and very low deaths in this scenario. In that situation, that's going to skew the stats. Sometimes there's players who've had not very good playoff series and other players carried them or they had one good finals map, but they had monster group stages against the lesser teams and they farmed up and they've gotten to the end of the tournament and they look like they have monster stats. But you go back and you actually assess it all and you go, wow, this guy didn't have that much impact at all. Even though, yes, you have to win against lesser teams. So you've got to look who the sick games were against. So I'll give you an example. When Simple was the MVP of ESL1 New York recently, that's an incredibly high value performance because he had really good KPR, amazing fragging, quite low DPR, especially for someone like his career and the style of play, the risky style of play he plays. He's a, he's a huge playmaker. Add in as well, differential was very good. And then finally, every map he played in this tournament, I think he played nine maps, was against a team that ended up placing top four, the best teams in the tournament, two of them, the two best teams in the world. This is incredible stuff. I mean, this is not just really good stats and then the context of the stats and then the opponents and stats and then the style of play. This is everything you can want and that tells you that's an amazing concept. But notice that the number didn't tell you how many maps you played, uh, not uh, who against rather, or how good the person they played against was or what the context of his playing style is. It can't tell you that within just a number. So you had to use your brain again and your eyes. Likewise, on the other end of the scale, there are tournaments where Happy has had amazing stats and actually he wasn't the MVP. Like when they won DreamHack, when LDLC won DreamHack Winter 2014, Happy himself to this day proclaims that he was the MVP and everyone else says, Lopez says he was the MVP, etc. And the thing is, in terms of the numbers and the differentials and, the, and all this sort of stuff, yeah, fantastic numbers, easily the best on LDLC. Problem is, when I watched the actual games and I was taking note of people who had significant kills and people who had a key round that broke up and something or a key round when it was a tight game and you were going to lose the scenario, the person who had the most of those, for my money, in the tournament and played the hardest role, entry, was Kiyoshima and he still had pretty decent stats. And so as a result, I rewarded him the MVP. I thought he was the reason why they won the tournament. He was the most valuable player and Happy could have done all of that and they would have lost in the round of eight or they would have lost in the final. And this could have happened many times over. Now, stats in general serve a purpose, but they serve a purpose. Your purpose is not to look at stats and obey everything you think they tell you or very simplistic conclusions. They're good for glancing at and getting a very loose outline, and then going investigating if you want to make definitive conclusions. People use these stats way too definitively. People think they can tell a lot of the story without watching the game, and that the stats tell them a lot, and that it tells them who did good. Who, it tells, they think that the number tells them their qualitative judgment, even though the qualitative judgment is an act that they themselves are doing, and therefore how could the stat tell them that? They themselves are even applying it to the number, but they're doing it with no context, and therefore it's of no value, the judgment. So sure, it's better to have stats than to have no stats, but stats need to be put in their place as a servant. If stats are the master, we will be bound by the tyranny of stats and we will have to actually all turn around to each other and say, yes, the player who just had the best differential must have been the best guy. Oh, but didn't the other guy win lots of clutch? No, the number tells us he's the best. And the guy who had a differential, he underperformed and he needs to really back his ideas up. But wasn't he on the worst team and wasn't he playing with low econ all the time and an opponent, play, a teammate played particularly poorly in his sight and he never had a chance to really trade out or get more kills? Nope, sorry, the number says minus, he was worse. You see the tyranny that will be under there. We won't be allowed to watch the games anymore and use our brains and actually come to reasonable conclusions. So in general, stats don't tell you that much. They certainly don't tell you as much as people think they do. They tell you something, but it needs to be supplemented with the meat of the actual discussion, which is watching the game, thinking about the game, and how we think about the game.